Hi everybody, in this video we are going to talk about a concept known as polarity. Polarity occurs when a molecule exhibits partially positive and negative ends due to the unequal or asymmetrical sharing of electrons. Polarity is caused by electronegativity differences and this is what causes one atom of a bond to have more electrons than another which results in an asymmetrical sharing of electrons. So for example in hydrogen fluoride as you can see over here the fluorine is much more electronegative than the hydrogen and because of that the electrons tend to go toward the fluorine and we draw the electrons going toward fluorine with this arrow with a little dash on it and in the image you can clearly see that the electron cloud for fluorine is red while the electron cloud for hydrogen is blue and that just means that in this area it is partially negatively charged and in the blue area it is partially positively charged and a simple way to explain why this occurs is, well, let's just take an example using a model. So we know that um, hydrogen has one proton and fluorine has nine protons. And remember, two of the electrons are the core electrons and we have seven valence electrons surrounding it. So I'm going to draw seven valence electrons there. And this one proton is well, hydrogen and it has one electron. And in this bond they're forming, all that's happening is that these two electrons, these two valence electrons are being connected. And as a result, they have an octet, right? Now you can think of it this way. You can think of this fluorine as still having nine of its electrons and nine electrons and nine protons cancel out to have a neutral charge. And over here, this one electron that's now part of the bond is kind of still there because it's like right there, but like it's part of the bond. But that one electron cancels out with that one proton to make it neutral. So if there's no hogging of electrons, both of these electron clouds surrounding the atoms would technically have a neutral charge. And this happens only when they share electrons equally. But if the fluorine decides to be a bit greedy and decides to start stealing or pulling electrons toward it, then guess what happens? This electron that's over here might want to spend its time a little bit closer to the fluorine. So instead of being over there, it might be maybe over here. And if it's over there, actually no, let's put a better location. What if it's like over here, like much closer to the fluorine than it is to the hydrogen? And if this happens, then we can kind of say that this part or the right side of the electron cloud of the molecule will have more electrons, although this electron is like not really close to the fluorine, but it's close enough to count as like a partially negative charge. And because it's closer to fluorine now, this fluorine or this side of the molecule now has just a bit more electrons. And because of that, the number of electrons and protons don't balance out anymore. So you have more electrons and protons, so this side will be partially negative. Meanwhile, on this side, the negative charge doesn't want to hang out with the hydrogen anymore. It likes to hang out more with the fluorine. And because the hydrogen experiences less of that negative charge, which is kind of getting farther and farther away if you think about it, and because it gets farther away, you experience less of that negative one charge. And because of that, this partially negative charge can cancel out an entire plus one charge. And therefore, what you have left is a partially positive side. So that's my best explanation for why partially negative and positive charges form in molecules. And... I think it's time for us to move on to another topic. So this unequal sharing of electrons in a covalent bond occurs because of electronegativity differences. So what exactly qualifies as polar and, you know, not polar?
So something is nonpolar or maybe just slightly polar depending on the number. For this, maybe around 0 0.3 and up. So something that's nonpolar or slightly polar if the electronegativity difference is less than 0 0.5. And if the electronegativity difference is 0, then it's definitely nonpolar since it's equal sharing. But if they're just a little bit different, then you could say that it's nonpolar technically. Or if you want to be more specific, you could say, oh, it's slightly polar, but not that polar yet. So what about polar? Well, if something is a polar bond, it has to have an electronegativity difference between 0.5 and 1.5. So the two atoms have to have a difference of between 0.5 and 1.5, and that qualifies as a polar bond. Now, if the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.5, then at this point, it becomes an ionic bond because at this point, the sharing of electrons is so H-symmetrical that one atom decides to take the electrons for itself and make itself an anion. So it no longer becomes covalent, and it becomes ionic. So for example, sodium chloride has a huge electronegativity difference, and because of that, it's an ionic compound because it's no longer covalent. They're not sharing electrons. The chlorine like just wants the electrons, so it just becomes an anion and that makes the sodium a cation, and that becomes an ionic compound. But we're not going to focus much on those types of bonds. We're going to focus on the first two, since those two are more relevant to what we're talking about. So we mentioned this arrow. This arrow is called a bond dipole moment. It is indicated by an arrow, or more specifically, a vector. And this shows the movement of electrons from a less electronegative atom to a more electronegative atom that wants the electrons more from the bond. And we tend to use dipole moments for polar bonds only because for nonpolar bonds, you're assuming that it's equal sharing. So yeah, if you add all the dipole moments and there's a net vector or arrow that exists, then the molecule is considered polar. So in this example, since there was only one dipole and nothing cancelled out, then this molecule, HF, is considered polar. Now, a net vector or a net dipole can happen due to asymmetry or if one vector overpowers another. So I'll show you an example of that soon. But here's something to consider. Linear trigonal planar tetrahedral trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral molecular geometries are considered symmetrical. So symmetry has a way of making things nonpolar. So for example, for this molecule, CF4, notice how the F is much more electronegative than the C. And because of that, the electrons like to go toward the fluorine. But notice how these four vectors cancel out because the molecule is symmetrical. This molecule is tetrahedral, and tetrahedral molecules are symmetrically placed so that when the vectors are formed, they all cancel out. And this occurs because these four arrows have the same magnitude because the electronegativity difference between the C and F is constant for all four of them. So because of that, and because the molecule is symmetrical, they all end up canceling out. And that ends up with a net vector of zero, so no net vector, and that makes it nonpolar. Now, let's take a look at one more note. CH bonds have an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4, but we typically consider these bonds to be nonpolar since 0 0.4 is less than 0 0.5 if you think about it. So you could say it's slightly polar, or even just say that it's just nonpolar straight then and there. So, now that we've talked about all this, let's try to do a few practice problems to see whether we can determine polarity. We are going to first look at phosphite. So phosphite looks like this. So let me just draw a phosphite out. And one lone pair there. And which ones have the negative charge? This one, this one, and this one. Now we have to think about what shape this forms. So this forms 
a shape that has to do with a steric number of four because there are four things attached to the phosphorus. And since there's one lone pair, then I can say that this is going to be trigonal pyramidal or just trigonal pyramid. And since it has a steric number of four or higher, we have to draw the wedges. So let's draw the wedges. So I'll just make one of them a solid wedge and one of them a dashed wedge. And this is how you draw phosphite in its 3D configuration. So this was all from the last video. So if you want to look at that, go for it. So we have to remember from the last video how these things look like. Trigonal pyramidal kind of looks like this. Let me try to draw it. It looks like this with the central atom there. So I labeled that as phosphorus. And the three O's are kind of just like in a tripod position. And then what points up is the lone pair. And now let's draw the dipole moments. So oxygen is more electronegative than phosphorus. So we can conclude that we can draw an arrow like that with a little perpendicular dash there. And we can do that for all three of them. And note that we don't do it for the lone pair, because if you think about it, why would electrons want to travel to the lone pair? Since the lone pair is literally just electrons that are negatively charged, why would electrons want to travel to electrons since they're the same charge? So it doesn't make any sense. But it makes sense for electrons to travel to atoms because atoms have protons in them. So make sure to not draw any bond dipoles toward the lone pairs. Now let's think, is this polar or nonpolar? Well, remember, to determine polarity, we have to see whether a net vector exists. And if it exists, then it's polar. And remember, if the net vector is nothing, then it's nonpolar. Now you can think of the vectors as a tug of war. So let's just say there's a central atom and there are two atoms that are very electronegative and want to hog the electrons from the middle. So there will be a vector there and a vector there. So who wins? Well, they both don't win because think about it. If you pull equally hard to the left and to the right, then of course, these pools will cancel out, and in the end, the electrons won't move anywhere. And because of that, you can kind of say that the net pool is zero because they cancel out, and because of that, there's no charge that forms since their pool is canceled out. So, not a great explanation, but I tried my best. So, let's move on to this question Is this polar or nonpolar? Well, we have to think about if the tugs cancel out each other. So in this 3D drawing, if we draw the bond dipoles, it looks like that. And notice how they're all pulling downwards. And because they're all pulling downwards and there's nothing that's pulling it back up, that means that these vectors are not being canceled out. And because of that, that means that this ion over here, this phosphite ion is going to be polar. So. The net dipole, well, the net dipole, you could draw it like this. And yeah, let's also label the partial charges. So this will be a partially negative charge. This will be partially negative. This will be partially negative. And the top will be partially positive since the arrows are pointing away from it. Now, this would be the full answer, I guess. But I wanted to go back and mention something. I wanted to say that these fluorines have a partially negative charge and that the carbon has a partially positive charge, but when you consider this molecule altogether, it's nonpolar because, as I said before, the net dipole is zero since these individual dipole moments all cancel out. So although there are more electrons here, 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 and here, due to the tugging of electrons by fluorine since it's more electronegative, the overall molecule is going to be in a way neutral since these arrows cancel out. I know it's a little bit confusing, but basically polarity is determined by whether there's a net vector or not. So if there's a net vector, then it's polar. If there's no net vector for the bond dipoles, then it is nonpolar. So even though 
CF4 might have a bunch of partially negative and positive charges on its atoms, in the end, polarity is determined by whether the net vectors of the bond dipole moments add up to zero or not. So consider that difference and think about that when you determine whether something is polar or nonpolar. So let's take a look at the next example. CO2 looks like this, a fairly easy molecule to draw like that. And this is linear because it has a steric number of two and the only thing that a steric number of two could have is linear. And we can talk about the bond angles if we want, but let's not because that's from the last video. So let's think about this, polar or nonpolar? Well, we could draw the bond dipoles and they look like that actually. And although this is going to be partially negative, partially positive, partially negative, remember the definition of polarity is whether there's a net dipole. And since these two arrows cancel out, since they're clearly going opposite sides and they're tugging at each other, they're tugging against each other, so they cancel out. And you have no net dipole. And because of that, oh, that looks like P, sorry. It's supposed to be a D. And because of that, this molecule is nonpolar. So it's your choice whether you want to include these partially negative and partially positive charges. But I think I would include it just for um, the sake of being as accurate as possible, I guess. So let's move on to the next question. I know. So let's fill the octet for O first. So there are 11 electrons. And so we would do this, put a double bond there, and there would be three electrons left, and you'd put it there. And we're not going to draw resonance structures, although you're free to do so, because electronegativity is determined by the two atoms and not the type of bond that they're making. So because of that, we can say that the electronegativity between the two is going to be enough to make a polar bond. Although, as you'll see later, it's actually not enough. So I would say that oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So I would say that this molecule is polar. And at first you might think, okay, it's polar. But if you look at this table here, you see that N and O have an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4. And since 0 0.4 is less than 0 0.5, then you can call this either slightly polar or even nonpolar if you want to simplify it that much. But this would be the better answer and this would be the generic answer. And the partially negative charge would be there and the partially positive charge would be there. So let's move on to the next question. Thiol cyanate, SCN. So carbon is in the middle, sulfur is to the left and N is to the right. And since there's a negative charge, I think the negative formal charge will go on the nitrogen, which is the most electronegative atom out of three. So if nitrogen has a negative formal charge, that means it has an extra electron. So since it has six electrons, it needs two bonds. So it looks like that with a negative formal charge. And this would be sulfur, and it would look like that. So there are resonance structures for thiocyanate, although for electronegativity, all we need is the atoms to see whether it's polar or nonpolar. So using this chart, we can see that S and C have really close electronegativities. They're like 0 0.03 apart. And because of that, this bond will be nonpolar. Now, what about this bond over here, C and N? Well, C and N are around 0 0.5 in the difference of the electronegativity. And because of that, you can say this is either polar or just slightly polar since it's at the border between nonpolar and polar. So for simplicity, I'll just say that this is slightly polar and it goes that way. So the net dipole is just this one arrow. So the net dipole will just be like that. And I could also draw this for the previous question too since it's basically the same structure where there's only one arrow. So the net dipole will just be that one arrow. I guess I should make them the same size to be more accurate though. So let me just make them the same size for accuracy purposes. And which side will be partially positive and which side will be partially negative? Well, I think this side is partially negative 
and you could either label here here but basically the left side is partially positive in this case and if you want to be super specific just label the carbon as the partially positive side so i think that's all for this question um let's move on to the next question h2o so h2o just looks like this and we could draw the 3d orientation of the um, lone pairs if we wanted to so we could draw it like that notice how this is tetrahedral and remember that the bond angle for water is 105 degrees from the previous video so it will be 105 degrees and this is a bent structure and let's draw the bond dipoles so the bond dipoles will point upwards because oxygen is the more electronegative atom and notice how the net dipole overall points up I know that's an exaggeration of the size, but maybe just like that, maybe. And why does it point up, and why doesn't it point like a little to the left or maybe a little to the right? Well, this is because when you add vectors, you have to think about what you're doing. So let's see what happens when we add these two vectors. So we can consider the vertical components and the horizontal components of vectors when we do this. So these two are the vertical ones and these two are the horizontal ones. Notice how the horizontal ones cancel out each other because this and this cancel out. Like you could think of this as the positive arrow and the negative arrow, and they cancel out. Now two arrows pointing in the same direction amplify each other. So the net dipole will be like that. So yeah, um, H2O in this case is clearly going to be polar. And in the picture, you can see that much of the electron density is in the oxygen, so that means that over here, this is partially negative, and these two oxygens are partially positive, which is why the area here is blue. Blue stands for partially positive. So, let's move on to the next question. C2H5F. Now let me take a look at, okay, that's good, okay. C2H5F. It kind of looks like this, so I'm just going to draw it really quickly and it looks like that and this has six electrons on it and let's actually do the 3d orientation so we have to orientate this 3d so let's do that and let's make this 3d as well so i'll make this the front and this the back and again the reason why i'm adding these broken wedges and these solid wedges is because this is tetrahedral with a steric number of 4, so it has a 3D orientation. This is all from the last video, by the way. So, is this polar or nonpolar? Well, let's draw the bond dipoles. So, fluorine is much more electronegative than carbon, so draw an arrow like that. And remember at the beginning where I said that the CH bond can be considered nonpolar since it has an electronegativity difference of 0 0.4 which is less than 0 0.5 so you could call it slightly polar but for simplicity purposes it can be considered nonpolar so we're not going to draw bond dipoles for nonpolar bonds so we see only one bond dipole so the overall bond dipole will just be like that now let's label the partially positive and negative ends so this will be partially negative and that will be partially positive and I think that's all for this one, and clearly this one will be, well, polar. So let's move on to the very next question, O3. So this one is ozone, and this is a very special molecule because you might expect it to be nonpolar since, well, let's first draw it out actually. So ozone is a little bit hard to draw, but I think we could do this, so three O's attached but we need to make it so that they all have an octet. So what can we do? Well, I could, I guess, start off by counting the number of electrons. Six times three is 18. We made four bonds, I mean, two bonds so far. So four electrons, that's 14 electrons left. How about let's do the lone pairs? So this needs two lone pairs. So that will be 10. And after that, we could just, you know, put the electrons wherever. So. I can make this have 6 and this have 4. So, you know, 4 plus 6 is 10, and we used up all our electrons. But you notice that this has only 6 out of 8 of its valence electrons. It's not very happy. So how do we fix this? Well, we could actually move this electron down to form a bond, 
and this is similar to what we do for resonance, and boom. All I did was I moved an electron, and look at that. Every oxygen now has an octet. So this has a negative formal charge, and this has a positive formal charge. And let me erase all the math on the side. And let's now figure out if this is polar or nonpolar. But before we do that, I think I want to draw the resonance structure for this because I think it's important to do that. So let me do that then. So let me move this pi bond to become a lone pair. And let me reverse that action by moving this lone pair into a pi bond. And you end up getting this. So let me draw this carefully. This has a negative formal charge, and there's a lone pair on top of the middle oxygen. And over here, it's a double bond with two lone pairs. So let's draw the resonance hybrid. So how do we draw that? Well, we have to find out which ones are the localized electrons and which ones are the delocalized electrons. So the localized ones are the sigma bonds and the pi bonds are the ones that are delocalized. So I'm going to draw some dotted lines. And now let's place the positive formal charge on there. And I think that since this is a symmetrical molecule, I can confidently say that this has a minus one half and this has a minus one half, since you can think of it as these two oxygens kind of sharing that minus one formal charge between each other. So this is the resonance hybrid for ozone and if you think about it at first this might seem nonpolar since there are no dipole moments since you can't draw arrows but according to my research apparently if you have a negative formal charge that means that you like to have more electrons because there are more electrons on you and that's what makes the formal charge negative in the first place and because this oxygen has more electrons than this oxygen, which tends to have a positive formal charge, which means that it lacks electrons, then what actually happens is that there's actually a dipole moment that occurs because of these formal charges. And because of that, this is actually polar. And let me draw the net dipole. It looks like that. And this would be partially positive, And these two oxygens would be partially negative. So a little bit messy, but it was a surprise, but I found out that ozone was polar for this reason. So let's now move on to the next question, CH2Cl2. So it'll look like this. Let me draw the lone pairs. And let me draw the 3D configuration since, of course, this is um, tetrahedral and has a steric number of 4. So th is this polar or nonpolar? Well, let's draw the bond dipoles, and it kind of looks like that. So this will be partially negative, partially negative, partially positive. So what do we do now? Is this polar or nonpolar? Well, if you remember for tetrahedral, it kind of looks like this. It's a tripod with, you know, um, a tip that shoots up. So notice how the bond dipoles are pointing down in general. So the net dipole is actually, well, in this case, in this picture, you could say it's pointing that way. But in this picture, you could say it's pointing down. And because of that, since the net dipole is there, this will be polar. So circle that as your answer, and let's move on. So the last question will be a little bit tricky, but let's draw the bond dipoles first. So bond dipole there, bond dipole there, bond dipole there, and bond dipole there. So for this picture, the net dipole will be going straight up. And for this picture, there's actually no net dipole since if you think about it this arrow and this arrow actually cancel each other out since they're equal in magnitude since the electronegativity difference is the same so this has no net dipole so this is non-polar now for this one this is polar because it has a net dipole and we could label the charges if you want this is negative positive positive and partially negative this is partially positive partially positive partially negative and partially negative. Now, as you can see, these two have the same chemical formula, C2H2Cl2, yet one of them is polar and one of them is nonpolar. So that's something really cool to watch out for. And just make sure to draw your pictures when doing these types of problems. So, so in this question, I proved that
this square pyramidal structure for bromine pentafluoride is going to be polar. And that's all for this video. Have a nice day.